Ah, c'est vrai. Je commence avec la plus difficile ou la question la plus facile. Pouvez-vous introduire vous Ah, vous êtes right, c'est la difficile uh, question. Juste avant de parler, je voudrais like exprimer mon immense appréciation à tout le monde pour cette invitation très invitation to come. It's a remarkable center to find Suenmok uh, in Bangkok and a tremendous effort of the Thai community, the business community and individuals to make this uh, uh, possible. So with regard to uh, uh, myself, my name is uh, Christopher. I live in Totnes, Devon, uh, England. I am a small uh, servant of the Dharma. I have the privilege of offering teachings and writing in a uh, variety of uh, places. And uh, I am, of course, uh, English and uh, a human being, but at the deep level, of course, frankly, um, I am none of that, and how could I be? So, how did you ever first become interested in Buddhism? Yes. Yes. Um, my very first uh, initial uh, int uh, interest probably uh, began in, um, in what was called in Britain the Summer of Love. This is 1967. And I was working in London in the early part of that year. I was about 22 years of age as a journalist in uh, London and I decided to drop the job, drop the career and uh, make the journey to the east and specifically uh, India. And on that journey through Europe, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, uh, Nepal, um, I began reading and specifically some uh, of the teachers of uh, the Buddhist uh, tradition. And from Alan Watts, of course, and Tazaki Roshi, some of the Theravada books as well, and that uh, gave inspiration. The turning point really took place in Saranath. And I went uh, there while this hitchhiking and traveling on the road, and I have to say, Im I have immense gratitude and appreciation for the Muslim community, for the Arab people uh, of uh, Asia, for their kind and generous hospitality through this whole journey. And while in Saranath, I picked up a couple of small books. One was by the founder of the Buddhist Society in 1923. Um, named, he was a judge with the unusual name Christmas Humphreys. And he had a small booklet and which I still have at home, and another one, and two points really struck me. One was that um, uh, clinging is our problem. Clinging onto things is the human problem. And uh, second, um, going along with that, is the recognition of a nature of impermanence. And these two, it struck a chord with me because one, I was traveling on the road, in the end, probably around 25 countries, hitchhiking, busing, training, uh, etc. Nothing was worth clinging to. And of course, seeing impermanence by being on the road. The outcome of all of that was that three years later, here in Thailand, I was traveling north, hitchhiking uh, mostly, and stayed in a small monastery in Chumpon. I was deeply interested in the Buddha's uh, teachings and I said to a monk, look, it's very hard to find a Buddhist monk, abbot, who speaks English. This is, remember, this is now um, 1970, the very beginning of 1970. And he said, there is one teacher who speaks fluent English his name is Ajahn Buddhadasa, but he said, you're traveling in the wrong direction. I was going north to Bangkok, 
he says you've got to go five or six hours south at least to get back to him. And I thought, I'm going the opposite direction. I thought, damn it, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm, I just have to know. So I traveled down to uh, Watsunmok. Uh, there, got off the train at uh, Chaya, walked there, and met a, a lovely monk. He was an, had been an architect named Iterit, Pra Iterit. Also spoke really excellent English. I was introduced to Ajahn Buddhadasa, and a conversation took place, which another of those magical moments in life which turned the life. And this moment of meeting with him, as a young guy, I was probably about 25 years of age at that time, and I said to him, what really matters? What, what is it, as a human being, I really need to understand? That was the question. And in his enigmatic, warm smile, uh, there of the kind of probably little innocence and naivety of the Englishman uh, in front of him, he made a flamboyant gesture. He took hold of his robe and he pulled it off the shoulder. I still yeah, I have the visual image as I'm talking to you. Pulled it off the shoulder and he said, if you really want to understand life, if you really deeply want to understand, you cannot be identified with anything, including this idea, he said for himself, this idea that I am a monk. This, what is it? It's a piece of cloth. And I went, wow. Thinking, that way of looking, wow. And the outcome of that was I spent, I remember now, 17 days in the monastery, I was, I was a journalist before, so I'm one of those guys that asks questions. I was bursting with the questions. Would come to see him as often as I, you know, I, I could. And during that 17 days, um, I just thought, I, I've traveled a lot. I've been on the road for three years, 25 countries, traveled the length and breadth of Australia, etc. Now is some time to make an inner journey go traveling within, that, that was the, the interest. And I went to him and he said to me, he had no interest in helping me to be ordained, none whatsoever. And um, then he said to me, he, he called the novice over and he said, get me the Bible. What's this about? And he brought the Bible over and he said to me, Anybody who changes their religion does so because they haven't understood their own. So as me, you know, brought up the good Roman Catholic boy, you know, went to church every Sunday till the age of my early 20s. Uh, again, a completely different way of looking. And then he said, I'll just find you something in the Bible. And he turned to Genesis, the first chapter in the Bible, in the Torah, and in there, there's this famous one line, and it says, Thou shalt not bite of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. That was the sentence. He said, if you've understood that, you've understood the essence of all religions. And that was it. And I uh, had no interest, and I left. A um, little disappointed. I, didn't, I had no idea what this passage meant, of course. And I left, I hitchhiked north, traveled up through north. At that time, there was the war, the American government military war, of course, on the people of Vietnam, on the secret extensive bombing on the people of Laos. And I spent some time there, and I thought, I'm not going to take this indifference of Ajahn Buddhadasa for an answer. So I stayed up there a few weeks, traveled across the Mekong, hitched a Thai person in a, in a petrol station, said, oh, you shouldn't have to hitch. Here is 500 baht, quite a lot of money in 1968. You can get, you can get, here's, go and get the bus down. So I did. So I traveled down and I said to Ajahn Buddha Dasa, uh, I'm not taking no for an answer. Um, I want to be ordained. 
He said, okay, your motivation is good, it's uh, strong. He gave me a letter to uh, meet with Venerable uh, Ajahn Panyananda here in Bangkok, who was his very close friend, as I heard, would hear later. And through that, and then through Nagasena, um, in Bhikkhu Nagasena, who was in Wat Benjamin Bopit, he helped me again. And a few weeks later, I was a novice, Venerable um, Kitty Supo. Uh, and I was kindly named after the abbot, my ordinator, my preceptor, in uh, what Benjamin Bopit. And Kitty Supo, Supo means beautiful, and uh, Kitty means reputation. So that was the name I got, which still amuses my dear friends. <laughs> All right, so that's the story. So when did you return? So then I talked with Nagasena and he said, look, Ajahn Buddha Dasa is giving really the deepest teachings you can find. He speaks of emptiness, the voidness of um, I and my, of non-clinging, uh, of uh, uh, freedom, I'm not being identified with anything uh, uh, anywhere. He said, if you're going to understand that, he said, first you'll have to do vipassana meditation. I never heard the word vipassana before. So I went down, he said, at least minimum of three months. Good, solid practice. This will bring more depth and more receptivity if you go to have these question and answers with Ajahn Buddhadasa. That three months became three years. It was a strict monastery. The, we started at four in the morning, we finished at ten at night. Ajahn Damadaro, the Vipassana teacher and abbot in the Wat Chai Na, it was, it was called Wat Tao Court in those days, the old days. Um, he would give a talk every evening. He had no regard for books whatsoever. He, actually, books were very, banned there. He had no appetite for chanting. He felt it was a distraction. It was meditate, meditate, meditate. That was the uh, uh, priority. And in fact, years later, when I was teaching, actually for 40 years actually, every year, once a year, in the Thai monastery in Bodh Gaya, Ajahn Damodaro and some monks and nuns came and there, and he saw I'd written a few books. He was not very pleased at all, not very impressed with me writing books, he's, he, etc. This is you know, his, char his character. So while in the three years in Nakhon Si Tamarat, maybe three or four, five hours maybe on the train from uh, Wat Suen Mok, I would come up regularly with my burning questions, stay a few days with uh, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, get refreshed, uh, lo looking into the voidness of I and my, into dependent arising, into the three characteristics of existence, into moksha, into liberation, uh, there. come back, continue my practice. And that was extraordinarily helpful. So, in practice, where, where would you stay in Swanmok and how would you have access to Tantajan? So, he... Um, uh, if I may say, um, I stayed in a hut, of course, there was a monk uh, 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 there, and walking through the forest uh, in the night hours, in those days, 1970, 72, 73, we had a, a stick there to hit the ground to keep the spiders and the snakes away, and a cocoa tin with a candle, it was cut out as a hole, the monks cut out, and you put the candle in, and you walked uh, through the forest to check with the snakes uh, uh, there. And probably once a week, maybe twice a week, if I was burning with the questions, would uh, come to uh, see him, usually um, in the morning time after breakfast. And uh, just, just sit down and I would start uh, with my uh, questions uh, uh, there, very much based on uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, what he said. It always amused me, still does, that when lay, I want to mention this when I have the opportunity to give the talk, when lay people came, 
um, Thai people and many, of course, locally, but also from throughout Thailand, they would come with the dana, you know, the act of the gifts uh, uh, there and give offerings. And Tan Ajan never, ever did I hear out of his mouth him say the words either kop chai or kop kun. Never said, never said thank you. So I said to him, Monday, people coming Ajan and they're giving you, you know, the gift support Without them, we can't, there's no food, there's no shelter, there's no clothing, robes, and no medicine. And he said, it's dana, it's a gift. If I say thank you, I am giving something back. I am giving thank you back. He said, that wouldn't be dana, it's an exchange then. <laughs> it would be impossible to do this in the West. So people, people understood. New people think, I could see their eyes. No, no thank you, no kop kun, no kop chai uh, there. Uh, but people understood. Oh, giving is giving, not even a thank you in return. And of course, those that understood this loved him for it. He, he, he was an original mind, I mean, no question of that. All right. Did you need an appointment to see him? Um, at that time, no. Um, so I would just turn up and then he would say, you know, like this, I'll come back later. <laughs> like that, very just. <laughs> so it's not like uh, anything else, it was just like this. <laughs> and I knew, oh, I'll come back later. So uh, most times it would be the same day, but sometimes because of the visitors and of course other monks and uh, requests, so sometimes <laughs> like that, I, then I just go back. Um, right, where, the, where his room, or that little building that, there, just in front there was, um, uh, just in front there was a kind of like a courtyard with a wall around it uh, uh, there. And uh, so we would sit chair to, chairs actually, but um, um, facing each other uh, there. And that, that was the uh, meeting spot. Time to time I would see him in a, a kind of classic posture, um, having a nap you know, after lunch, as we would do, he would be curled up on the window ledge with a cocoa tin as his pillow. I <laughs> just... <laughs> this I would notice as well. This, again, early, 19, uh, early 1970s. The rest of us, we were provided with a small, beautifully made teak, wooden pillow, just curved, and we just use that for our headrest. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in those days that you are describing, uh, have you seen other foreign students as monks? Or uh, I forget, let me, sorry. I um, forgot to record this. So I can get a copy from you, can I? All right, nice. Um, during the time, as far as I know, 19, we're going back now to um, 1970, um, a couple of monks had stayed, Western monks um, had stayed there. Uh, one was Wimelo, German monk, who was ordained for about 25 years, and the other was, forget his name, Supano? Pasatico. Probably. Pasatico, exactly. So these two uh, uh, monks, um, I, women I'm still in contact with. He is now around 85, 86 uh, years of age, um, has some Parkinson's I, uh, uh, there, and still translating, still uh, writing, living a very quiet life there with some Dharma friends who have uh, contact with him. They rather loved the environment of the forest. Um, I spoke to women a, a little bit about this. Um, with myself, as a small difference here, I regarded myself as um, uh, a student of Ajahn Buddhadasa in a, almost a formal way, me meaning that my visits, the one-to-ones with him, were 
kind of critically important. They, it was essential. Um, Wimelo and Pasadico didn't kind of consider it in, in, uh, uh, in that way. Of course, they would listen when he gave uh, talks. But to myself, it was a very uh, important, as I say, and uh, uh, insightful period of time. Ajahn Buddha Das uh, never ever m mentioned, say, practicing um, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. He never mentioned that to me. He never spoke to me about uh, vipassana practice except in a, a general way. Um, so there was no priority in our communications of a kind of developmental approach, a path of practice. Uh, I can't recall hearing that language from him. Even though he was a master of mindfulness of breathing and uh, etc. So with him it was on the dialogue and on the immediacy of understanding that always took the priority. Occasionally some Westerners and Western monks would occasionally pop in but very few as I recall in the early 70s you know, stayed for any lengthy any uh, period of time. And for listeners, he was about 65 yes. at that time. And was that before or after he broke his hip and put on a lot of weight? Um, it was before. Um, so in the uh, early uh, uh, 70s, um, he wasn't using the stick, for, you know, for sure, which be, you know, became uh, known. And uh, he didn't walk around the forest a great deal, I, I, I have to say, uh, there. And, I, and also, because I'd see him eat, so it's not like he was a big eater. It, I think there is a, this phenomena, and I see quite a few friends, quite good, good friends of the same uh, uh, age, uh, where... Uh, the body, the cells of the body expand. It, it's nothing to do with uh, food. It's, it's just that the biological, evolutionary, physical condition. And he was one uh, uh, of, the, uh, of those. The, the tradition, the Buddhist tradition, um, unlike the tradition of the yogis in India, hasn't, unfortunately, given a, in the contemporary world given a great deal of emphasis, particularly to exercise. Time of the Buddha, of course, nine months a year, uh, the Sangha, the nomadic ones, the monks as they're called, and nuns, were walking, walking hills. That kept them strong and fit and lean. But um, over the centuries, it became more monastic and more sedentary. And I think this had some impact on health. Though in his younger years, when at the original Suan Monk, and then even when the Suan Monk where you visited him, he would walk back and forth regularly. Yes. So that's 10 miles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's a good point. Up to a point, he did a lot of walking. Yes. But as he became known, he that, spent that's a it. lot more time sitting in. It, it, exactly. It's the, 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 the cost. He, he, he would laugh, smile uh, to me because we were to, to talk about this as well. And he said, look, I turned up in this forest. He actually was in a nearby forest for a few years. But, uh, so at that time, more than 40 years earlier. And he said, I'm just living the forest monk's life. And he said, look what's gathered. He said, I haven't moved. But look what's gathered around, <laughs> around me. And part of the price for that, <clears throat> as Santikara just mentioned there, is the huge number of visitors. And then, of course, when the road got built, whoa, then it was like thousands because of the coaches, loads of people uh, per day. And I think that would have had quite some influence on his... Uh, capacity to do these uh, long walks he, he, he would do in the open countryside. The road changed a lot. Mm. Though, if he and his brother <coughs> hadn't published 
Thailand's longest-running Buddhist journal, people might not have heard about him. I, um, that's true. They might not have heard about him, but those kind of teachings, the, the gossip line, they would have, they, it would have gone far and wide. But he was not uh, into any kind of withdrawal, as you know, that he firmly advocated the development and the expansion of the Dharma. And, of course, he was a revolutionary. The, I mean, when, when you, you, one sits and listens to him, one never quite knew what might come out <laughs> there. And um, um, one of the things he said, more than one occasion, I thought, what do the Thai people think of this? He would say, flowers, candles, incense, temples is religion for thumb-sucking kids. <laughs> I mean, in Thailand, whoa, <laughs> this is radical stuff uh, there. Those of us who love that kind of free-spirited kind of original dharma about, about him really appreciated it. But amongst the more you know, religious, more orthodox, whoa, whoa. And it was that kind of fearlessness that gave and continues, in fact, to give us some inspiration uh, to not to be afraid to speak up. And if it displeases, it displeases. <laughs> By the time I was there, he had been saying for many years, there's a Thai proverb, to play a flute for the turtles. <laughs> but towards the end of his life, it was no longer turtles, it was rhinoceroses. And then he would talk about the white and yellow rhinoceroses. Yeah, yes. All the devoted people in white, as well as the monks yes. in yellow. Exactly. That, that, there, he, he, when we would have the meetings together, and the dog would be on the ledge above us both. And these people thought, hmm, would come. To, the dog's disrespectful. It should be uh, lower and try and shoo the dog off. And then Ajahn Buddhadasa would turn to the dog, and the name of the dog was Ajahn. Sompan. Sompan. Which is a Thai word for abbot. Abbot. <laughs> Even worse. For the Sompan, a monk would take them to the dog. <laughs> it's, it's, a lot of people would, it was a screening mechanism. Yes. As well, it was both a teaching. Yeah. But people who couldn't mm. take that would get angry and leave. Yes. When that lovely book, I believe the translator is here, of Handbook for Mankind. Were you the translator? So this book had a significant influence uh, uh, on me. I felt it contained some extraordinary precious insights which were equally applicable to the ordained and to the householders. I mean, he almost dismiss the division, the separation between the two uh, there. And I said to him, although the, the book was written in the, and prepared in the 1960s, I said to him once, why is it called Handbook for Mankind? The language has changed. I said it should be Handbook for Humankind. And he said, no it shouldn't. It should be Handbook for Sentient Kind. I mean, just <laughs> so sharp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. So during one of your visits to Swan Mall, mm. I think maybe by chance, uh, you had to, you had the, the chance to, to see the visit by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Mm, I was there. Mm. Was it by chance? And how was it? So, um, this would be, again, in the early 1970s, uh, I would... 70. 72. Well, so the uh, Dalai Lama, um, probably mid 30s, maybe at that time, you know, somewhere in that age age group. So he came to Thailand specifically to meet with Ajahn Buddhadasa, 
to pay respect to Ajahn uh, Buddha Dasa because his name had traveled far and wide and, and to the Tibetan uh, community. So the two of them had these meetings. There's a small hill behind and they would sit and uh, uh, talk up there. Ajahn Buddha Dasa asked the uh, Dalai Lama to give a talk to the monks. One has to, you know, one has to understand slight edge of competitiveness here um, in so far as the Theravada tradition regards itself, the bhikkhus, as the, those who protect the Vinaya, more disciplined, keep more to the rules, and the uh, Tibetan monks are much more liberal-minded, eating the afternoon, handling money, and many other things, and there was a little, you know, it goes on in, the, in the, these traditions uh, there. So I was very curious to hear from the Dalai Lama, who's quite a lovely soul and still is obviously, um, what he had to say to the monks. And the monks were kind of curious. And he, he sat down you know, where Ajahn Buddha Dasa usually sits in the stone circle out there. And he said to the monks, who is the Dalai Lama? And then he said, is the words coming out of the mouth the Dalai Lama? Uh, no. Is um, this piece of cloth the Dalai Lama? No. Is this face the, uh, the Dalai Lama? Are these the, 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 the manna, the beads, or, uh, uh, the Dalai Lama, or whatever? And, and then he said, the Dalai Lama is something, it's just by agreement. There is no real thing called the Dalai Lama. And the monks spontaneously, sadhu, sadhu. I, I listened and I thought, straight out of Ajahn Buddha Dasa. <laughs> I thought, I bet this has been something of the conversation. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, I could be wrong. But uh, it was beautifully expressed by the Dalai Lama, really uh, humbly uh, there. And it was a lovely teaching to the monks because it immediately dissolved the any subtle division of Dalai Lama and monks Mahayana and Theravada, etc. And, and that, that was a precious statement. <laughs> Did Ajahn Buddha Das ever get angry or annoyed or anything with your foreign questions or your pushiness or whatever you might have brought? Um, in a way, it was the un no, the answer. <laughs> Clear for me, none. Never. One, not one moment. Um, one has, has to, of course, and as you will know very well here, understand the nuances uh, of the Thai culture. So, in Thai culture, a person may say, Chai, you know, yes, but the ambience of the body and the language, chai can mean yes, it could be mean no, it could mean um, I'm hearing you, etc. There's a, a, a certain unknown element, not with Ajahn Buddhadasa. <laughs> so, soon as it was enough, um, he would just say something. I'm um, enough. And then I knew, boom, to go. And uh, come and see him a, 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 another time. So personally, I never exper experienced, not once. And I really appreciated that. But I'd, as I mentioned, I'd learned to use my eyes and ears for the nuance. Did he ever give you overt advice like, oh, you should do this, you should do that? Um, <laughs> uh, no, I can't think of anything. After this um, discussion together, something might, might uh, uh, arise. Um, I did once say to him, Ajahn, in the West, 
we would love your presence in the, in, in the, in, in the West. Um, the kind of teachings are so relevant. Why don't you think about coming to the West? It could be organized um, uh, uh, there. And uh, he said, I'm not going, it. this is the forest, I'm not, I'm not going any, anywhere. He said, I used to have to go to Bangkok <laughs> to, to, to speak in ba ba Bangkok. He, um, he rather looked upon uh, Bangkok as a city that lost its way. <laughs> he had very little regard <laughs> for Bangkok, I have to say, uh, there. And he said to me, no, he said, you go. <laughs> You're a Westerner. You live in that culture. You were born in that culture. You give the teachings in the West. That's your job. <laughs> I heard the same thing. It wasn't a specific instruction. But if you think somebody should do it, yeah. then you do it. Yeah, exactly. That, that, exactly. Instead of us trying to talk him into doing it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, is very much the, st the, the style. You have to take responsibility and engage in the uh, action uh, for himself. Going to the West, no. <laughs> what did Ajahn Damadaro think of you going to visit Ajahn Buddhadasa? Well, um, he had great respect for Ajahn Buddhadasa. Uh, Despite there. the books. Despite the, despite the many, the many books, um, his, uh, I, mean, I mean, he knew I would go no matter what he said. So there was never any, uh, any wish nor attempt to only stay in the monastery, don't leave it, uh, 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 etc. He himself had been to pay respect as well. He himself had had some good conversation with him and understood that. Um, and, and he knew the nourishment I got from going there. It would often only be for a few days. Time to time, with the good support of the translator, sometimes Nagasena, who was in Ajahn Damodaro's monastery, and sometimes with a, a Thai monk who spoke very good English. And I remember giving a talk and mentioning uh, to the monks and the nuns uh, so sentence by sentence, English Thai, English Thai translation. And I said something about um, I and my. And Ajahn W was sitting on what I used to call the throne, the high, high chair. And he turned to a, a novice. And I heard him, he went, Ajahn Buddhadasa. <laughs> With a smile on his face. <laughs> so it... it uh, uh, it was that. The only question that arose, I think it was a fairly valid question, to be fair. He said, Ajahn Buddha Dasa's teachings, question and answers, inquiry and reflections, uh, were excellent. But Ajahn Dhamma would say, why doesn't he teach uh, vipassana as a real practice, re formal practice? Why is the art replacing the formal uh, uh, practice. And that was the one question that uh, uh, he had. <laughs> so which major influence uh, from Buddha do you see in your own teaching until today? Uh, uh, how long would you like me to talk <laughs> on this question? Um, the, the primary the, the kind of um, jewel in the crown, I think, um, is the realizing the emptiness of I and my, of all ahamkara, all I-making activity, the hopelessness, the pointlessness, the uselessness, the emptiness of it. That's the residue. His famous, his, his, uh, he, he would take those four words from the... Uh, uh, Majima Pachipata, the middle length sayings of um, Sabe Dharma Nalang Abhinasaya, nothing is worth being identified with, no Dharma, no thing worth being attached to or holding on to. He said, Everything I've ever said weaves its way through this single sentence of the Buddha. And that 
had registered with me from Saranath there, had deeper resonance uh, over the years. So the emptiness uh, of under for understanding, the depth of understanding, and this non-clinging approach were two things that genuinely are outstanding. I would ask him, the Buddha speaks a lot about Brahma Viharas and the power of uh, abiding in kindness and karuna, metta and compassion, etc. I said, but you never, in all the conversations, you never mention anything about the Brahma Viharas, not once to me, uh, there. I said, why, why, why not there? And, and sh there are some practices, there's the metta chant, but also some meditation practices around that. He said, don't bother with it. He said, not important. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, there. He said, if the panya, the wisdom comes, then out of the wisdom, all the metta and karuna, kindness and compassion will come naturally. Concentrate on wisdom. So I did. Uh, thank you very much for the good questions. Thank you, Sadhikara and Petra. <laughs>